Hello, I'm Mark Davis, a barrister at Six Pump Court, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest Environment Law News podcast, brought to you in association with LexisNexis. In this podcast, we'll look at the recent publication of the Environment Bill, the Environment Agency's aim to become net zero by 2030, and the introduction of climate change risk assessments for bespoke permits. So, first of all, the Environment Bill. The first thing to note is that it's weighty, 233 pages of weight to be precise, so I've no doubt that you'll be delighted to hear that I won't be covering all of it in this podcast. However, with some colleagues in chambers, it is proposed to analyse the bill in some detail, which will be published in a separate article soon, we hope. So if this is an area of interest to you, keep your eyes peeled for that. What I'm going to do in this podcast today is just highlight a few of the important aspects of the proposed new legislation. First up is the provision in the bill for the Secretary of State to set, by regulations, long-term targets in respect of the environment. Now, by long term, the bill indicates periods longer than 15 years, and the power to set these targets come with a requirement that targets be set in certain priority areas, which include air quality, water, biodiversity, resource efficiency, and waste reduction. The targets must also specify the date and standard that is to be achieved, and that must be capable of being objectively measured. When setting these targets, the bill requires that the Secretary of State seek advice from independent experts, but it also envisages a cost-benefit analysis concerning the targets against the various impacts, so environmental, social or economic, etc. What the bill does allow the Secretary of State in filling in the gaps in a post-Brexit regulatory environment is, I would suggest, a great deal of flexibility. But there is some concern about a lack of short-term targets and a potential unwanted consequence that there does not appear to be any provision for holding the government to account on these targets until the year 2037. But then again, in the past, concerns have been raised about the lack of current long-term targets. So really, who knows who's winning? The second major element to highlight in the bill is the proposed Office for Environmental Protection, about which much has already been spoken. Now, the bill requires it to be set out in a written strategy how the OEP intends to avoid any overlap with the Committee on Climate Change. That strategy document must also include an enforcement policy that sets various requirements, including how the OEP determines whether failures to comply with environmental law are serious or not. Now, the point in relation to the Committee on Climate Change is an interesting one, as the Committee has specifically raised concerns about interference in its current relationship with Parliament by the OEP. Now, that's a system that the Committee on Climate Change considers is working well at present. Presumably, on the basis that the Bill requires a statement of strategy setting out how any overlap between the OEP and the Committee will be avoided, Parliament also agrees that that's a system that's currently working well. The second point, that the enforcement policy, is significant as it will form part of the critical threshold test that is likely to determine how effective the enforcement function of the OEP actually is in practice. As to other small elements of the bill, one small change is that ministers must now have due regard to the core environmental principles. One might question whether this is actually improvement on the previous form of the words that simply require ministers to have regard to the principles. We shall simply have to wait and see. Part four of the bill will strengthen air quality control powers, whilst part six and seven deal with nature and biodiversity issues. Part six would see the imposition of a complex planning condition on almost all new development in order to secure net gains by means of a newly styled biodiversity gain plan. Part 7 would implement the Law Commission's work on conservation covenants. Now, all of this and more will be discussed in the paper that I mentioned at the start. Moving to our second topic, the Environment Agency's aim of becoming net zero by 2030. Now, the agency has set itself the aim on the basis that its own activities and those of its supply chain are taking as much carbon out of the atmosphere as it is putting into it. 
And quite wisely, the agency has identified that offsetting will be part of this, and it has calculated that its target would mean reducing the emissions of its own activities and supply chain by a further 45%, with the remaining emissions addressed through tree planting, restoring soil quality and peat bogs or other measures. The approach proposed by the agency is one which is quite tailored to their situation, in as much as a major part of its carbon contribution comes from building and maintaining flood defence work, rather than its own buildings and travel demands as in some other areas. What's really interesting is the 2030 date that has been chosen, 20 years in advance of the stated national target. I've no doubt that everyone listening will of course remember the last amendment made in the summer to the Climate Change Act 2008, one of Theresa May's last actions as Prime Minister, and that intended to ensure that the UK is carbon neutral by 2050. That date, the date in the revised Climate Change Act, was based on the recommendation of the report of the Climate Change Committee and their report, Net Zero, the UK's contribution to stopping global warming, which was published in May 2019. Now that report was published as a way of looking at the UK's commitments as a signatory of the 2015 Paris Agreement. The target in that report relies on measures to reduce emissions through improved efficiency and new technology, as well as offsetting in carbon capture and storage, whilst also factoring in future growth predictions. That report states that existing policy must be ramped up significantly and that the committee did not consider it credible for the UK to aim to reach net zero emissions earlier than 2050, which really puts the Environment Agency's announcement into context. It is full of ambition. The announcement also included reference to wanting to explore whether the agency could become an absolute zero organisation by 2050, so one where the agency's activities and supply chain would produce no carbon at all. Now, maybe that, given the agency's background, it can identify sector-specific advantages that will allow them to achieve its targets much more quickly than others, and it will certainly be leading the way if it can do so. Finally for today, the new requirement that applicants for certain new bespoke permits must complete a risk assessment on adapting to climate change. Now this applies to any application for a new bespoke waste and intensive farming installation permit if it is expected to operate for more than five years, which I would suggest most will. These risk assessments must be completed even if the site is not expected to be operational in 2050 and applicants will need to calculate their climate change risk screening score when completing the new permit or intensive farming installation application form. The appropriate worksheet, based on the relevant river basin and climate projection data for the site's location, must be filled in. Each worksheet lists potential changes in weather and climate that may occur between now and 2050, but other climate variables that could impact operations can be included. Applicants are asked to consider as part of the process critical thresholds where a tipping point is reached. So, for example, a specific temperature where site processes cannot operate safely, changes to averages, again, for example, an entire summer of higher than expected rainfall that causes waterlogging, and locations where hazards may combine to cause a greater impact. Applicants must first assess the impact from each of the weather and climate change scenarios to determine a risk score, which will then reflect the likelihood of something happening, multiplied by the severity of its impact. Those applicants with risk scores of five or more must propose mitigation measures and then reassess the risk, taking the mitigation measures into account. That must then be submitted with the climate change risk assessment alongside the application form. Those who score less than five will still need to complete the risk assessment and retain it as part of the environmental management system, referring to it in the management plan to be submitted with the application. The Environment Agency will then the application and may apply conditions to some permits to manage climate change risks and may ask the applicant to provide a more detailed assessment in the future. If this is all sounding worryingly Greek to you, Fear not, as examples of the completed risk assessments worksheets can be found on the gov.uk website, along with a facility to search the current catchment data according to postcode.
and completing these, good luck. Thank you for tuning in to this Environment Law News podcast. For more information on any of these stories, or if you would like to discuss any of the topics raised in more detail, please contact Six Pump Court on 0207 797 8400 asking for Mark Davis, or contact our colleagues at Let's Nexus in the PSL Environment Team. Thank you.